George Chen, Catherine Cooper, Veronica Weiss. These are the names of three students of the University of California, Santa Barbara. Chen wanted to become an engineer. Cooper studied archaeology and art history. And Weiss, known by all around her as wise beyond her years, pursued a high-level math degree. In 2014, these three bright students, along with a number of other students, were tragically murdered in one fateful evening by a crazed lone gunman, determined to wreak bloody havoc on anyone he saw. Just 20 minutes before these precious lives were lost, the killer posted a public video on YouTube describing in grotesque detail describing in grotesque detail his ideological motivations for genocide and giving reasons why these innocent souls should die by his hand. The video posted by the killer was meant to leave a legacy immortalized by the internet. He wanted the world to remember what he did and why he did it. Over the next few days, a frenzy of sharing and redistributing, the video took the internet by storm. The killer had achieved his coveted nationwide fame. The world faces a new kind of threat the performance terrorist. Performance terrorists are individuals who seek recognition and acceptance through acts of extreme cruelty and violence that are often very public. In the new era of technology and communication, performance terrorists can utilize social media to, to spread their violence, gaining an incredible reach. The internet gives citizens of the 21st century a unique opportunity for widespread communication of ideas and stories through social media. However, if in the wrong hands, social media can become a deadly weapon by which murderers incite and spread uncontrollable violence. Through careful and intelligent internet reform, the United States would protect its citizens from mass killers who utilize social media to broadcast death to the public. Now, when talking about technology and law, two very complicated topics, we must properly define our terms so as to create more solutions than problems. This speech concerns itself with Section 230, Title 47 of the United States Law Code, which deals with the rights and freedoms granted to any interactive computer service, or for short, we'll call it social media. George Pike, a writer for Information Today, describes Section 230, saying, quote, whether that information, referring to any content posted by a user on a platform, is obscene, offensive, infringing, defamatory, illegal, or misleading, the host of the content cannot be held liable. Platforms that rely on user-generated content, such as Facebook or Instagram or lesser-known chat forms like Reddit or 4chan, have no responsibility to monitor the content that lives and spreads on its platform. However, Section 230 does give us two exceptions to that rule. Sex trafficking and child pornography. If any content found on a site that relates to these two topics, the site must take it down immediately, otherwise the already laid out legal consequences for those crimes apply. Um, Section 230 allows for the constitutional protection of our First Amendment right within the Internet. However, it still lacks some crucial common-sense legislation that would protect American citizens. To illustrate this, my speech uses the example of the 2014 incel killer, Elliot Roger. Roger, the killer described in my introduction, was a part of a group known as incel, or for short, or for long, I guess, involuntary celibates. This was a group of young men who struggled to form romantic relationships, and they would meet online through mainstream social media or fringe chat forms to share their problems and seek advice from other young men. However, what started off as rather innocent in the beginning soon turned violent, promoting and inciting violence against women and other people or groups that they disliked. Through the careful examination of two examples of social media-fueled mass genocide, I will address the topic of Section 230 and internet regulation as it relates to preventing mass atrocity. And then to conclude, I will propose an amendment to Section 230 that would greatly, um, that would greatly protect American citizens and our internet. The algorithms baked into modern social media creates a system that rewards and encourages performance. Performance terrorists who already crave attention and fame utilize this system to broadcast content promoting death for their own fame. Performance terrorism has changed drastically along with the progression of technology. In previous years, these performance terrorists had to rely on the public media to report on their crimes to gain fame. This would be through news cycles or online articles. However, um, however, a writer for Moderate Voice, Stuart Bender, jokes, quote, platforms like Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube are powered by a framework that encourages, rewards, and creates performance. People who post cat videos cater this appetite for entertainment, but so do criminals. 
In the minds of mass killers and troubled school shooters lives this intense and undying desire for popularity and attention. Through modern technology, they can now create their own narrative not controlled by the media in hopes that they can finally feel recognized and understood. In addition to public crime throughout the internet, they oftentimes leave behind propaganda-like manifestos. In this case with Elliot Roger, he wrote a 141-page manifesto laying out all of his quarrels with the world. Kashmir Hill from Forbes writes about Roger's troubled past. Quote, Roger also authored a 141-page autobiography titled My Twisted World, which was sent to a local news station. He describes the events of his life since birth, blaming an obsession with World of Warcraft for lack of social development in middle and early high school, blaming his father for not teaching him how to woo women, blaming his mother for not remarrying into the rich upper class after his parents separated, and blaming his own social awkwardness for getting in the way of his making friends and meeting women. Performance terrorists will spend an exorbitant amount of time and energy to craft a careful narrative to publicize. They view themselves as actors in some sort of movie drama, ready to unleash their chaotic finale through a momentous atrocity. And then in the aftermath, they have to release some sort of propaganda-like manifesto to explain why their actions were a necessary part of the disturbing plot. In order to understand Elliot Rogers' mind, we have to look at the events that unfold during his killing spree. It's May 23rd, 2014, and Elliot Roger has murdered six innocent lives with an injuring an additional 14. Elliot had ingrained himself in the incel culture beforehand, which was already generating violent threats against women, proving the need, for, need and necessity for internet reform of Section 230. Just before his revenge, he posted a seven-minute-long seven, seven long video titled Elliot Rogers Retribution. As I watched this video, I felt sickened by his twisted and distorted view of the world. His acting felt theatrical, and everything in the video was fake. From his pompous expression to the golden hour sunray beaming across his face, it was easy to tell that this entire video was an act. However, everything was fake except for one thing, his intent to kill. Forbes writer Kashmir Hill writes, he, Elliot Roger, lives on a digital form due to online postings and videos, including a YouTube video titled Elliot Roger's Retribution, in which he explains that he is wreaking havoc, on, he's wreaking vengeance on the hot girls of Santa Barbara because women had rejected him for eight years since he hit puberty. Social media played a crucial part in his descent into murderous madness. The events leading up tell a sad story of a lonely boy who felt disconnected, confused, and ultimately alone. Looking at Roger's social media presence, he joined numerous online forums, and all of these forums tended to be a part of incel, including forums called Pua Hate, which stands for Pickup Artist Hate, Shy Love, and Forever Alone. And then he also joined some other, pla other platforms, oftentimes alpha male platforms. On one particular bodybuilding forum, he was criticized for his incel ideology. He responded to criticism by saying, quote, men shouldn't have to look and act like big animalistic beasts to get women. The fact that women still prioritize brute strength just shows that their minds haven't fully evolved. Women are not drawn to indicators of evolutionary fitness. If they were, they would be all over me. Criticism fueled him. <laughs> criticism fueled him, and all of this criticism became channeled within incel. In his manifesto, he even writes a thankful note about the forums that he had joined, saying, quote, a forum full of men who are starved of sex, just like me, confirmed many of my theories that I had about how wicked and degenerate women were, really are. Ben Zimmerman, a writer for Politico magazine, describes the group Elliot associated with. Quote, Elliot Rogers seemed to blame his troubles on sexual rejection by women, linking himself to a misogynistic culture of incels, all male, that has sprung up online. On message boards and in chat rooms, aggrieved men have worn the incel badge to justify a sense of victimhood at the hands of women who they feel have spurned them. While already mentally unstable, Elliot Roger has finally found a community that encourages and promotes his tragic behavior and ideology. And this is all made possible through communication technology. And on all of these forums, there is almost no common sense moderation. And conversation topics easily, easily stray into illegal or violent topics. One Pua hate member describes the moderation on these forums, saying, quote, the moderation policy was very laissez-faire. There was racism, definitely a lot of misogyny, and Elliot Rogers' type of comment couldn't have been uncommon. These viral subcultures oftentimes will spiral out of control. In the, in, in the culmination of the incel movement was Elliot Rogers' killings. A 2020 article in Business Wire describes these viral subcultures. 
saying, quote, today's online, fact, online conversations are controlled by influential power groups called factions or hyperactive internet subcultures who organize around their shared passions and spread viral conversations through social platforms. What's most disturbing about this whole entire event is that after Elliot Rogers' mass killing on the streets of Isla Vista, Incel upheld him as a hero. His actions emboldened a new level of a new level of perverse discourse within the twisted minds that populated incel forums. What's crazy is that the incels actually label him as a saint, and they, every year they celebrate the anniversary date of the killings. Tysta Witt writes in the Social Identity Psychology Journal, quote, online incel spaces have been observed referring to Elliot Roger as Saint Elliot, or the Supreme Gentleman, and have been seen celebrating the anniversary of the Isla Vista killings as Saint Elliot Day. Through an exploration of the effective and semiotic construction of St. Elliot and the treatment of Rogers' Manifesto as a potentially hagiographic text, one can reveal ongoing projects of reality construction that allows for the justification, enactment, and celebration of extreme violence. Members of incel become so ingrained in this culture that they start building their own twisted version of reality that allows them to carry out actions of extreme violence with a clear conscience. However, Elliot Rogers is not the only performance terrorist. There are others like him. In order to fully understand a performance terrorist, let us look at a second example. It's March 15th, 2019. Brendan Tarrant drives down the road, and he's about to enter a mosque and murder 51 Muslims and injure an additional 40. And he does this all on a Facebook live stream. This live stream was shared numerous times, which illustrates the power and influence social media can have on a person and ultimately a society. His actions were the catalyst, of, were the catalyst that encouraged a new wave of violent speech promoting murder and violence towards Muslims. Jamie Tarabay, a reporter for the New York Times, writes about Terrence's effect on social platforms after the killings. Memes featuring him, Terrence, spiked across the message boards of 4chan and 8chan. Scores of boards on 8chan are devoted to Mr. Tarrant, lionizing him as a saint. Much like Roger, Tarrant had his own cult-like fan base. He got what he wanted, notoriety and fame. Positive encouragement from these shady online forums overshadowed any negative condemnation. This emboldened him and sapped all remorse from his heart. Not only did Brent and Tarrant's violent actions spawn chatter online, but it also spawned other actions of violence from other performance terrorists. A month later in April, a terrorist attack in San Diego of, the similar, of a similar fashion was carried out, resulting in one fatality and multiple injuries. John Ernest was the name of this killer, and he had tried multiple times to commit this violence in the name of Brenton Tarrant. Ernest claims to have set fire to a mosque and spray paint for Brenton Tarrant, soon after the Christchurch shootings in New Zealand. He even writes his own manifesto about the event, attributing it to the New Zealand killer. His manifesto is littered with violent speech and racial slurs. Tarrant's gospel of violence created real-world consequences that warrant change. Tarrant captures the essence of a performance terrorist perfectly. The combination for desire for fame and Muslim hatred was a recipe for disaster. In the aftermath, he had achieved what he wanted, notoriety and fame. And again, this was all made possible through sharing and redistributing on social media. What's more, he even posted his own manifesto, like Elliot and Ernest. This was titled The Great Replacement, which was 81 pages of an ideological excuse for genocide. Much like Elliot's propaganda, much like Elliot's manifesto, this was blatant propaganda. He was calling other people to violence. This led me to ask a crucial question throughout this research process. Would Brent and Tarrant still have murdered those 51 Muslims if he couldn't post it on social media? Would he have done those actions if he couldn't share and encourage others to do the exact same that he did? Well, we know that performance terrorism thrives off of the notoriety and fame from social media. Through legislation that holds tech companies accountable for their actions, for the content living on their platforms, we can curb social media-fueled genocide and we can save innocent lives. The legislation that accomplishes, the, accomplishes this purpose, I believe, is Section 230. Currently, Section 230 states that no interactive computer service, again, social media, will be held accountable as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information provider, which is a random social media user. 
Brian Peach from Business Insider describes the event, the current function of Section 230. Quote, this essentially allows sites like Twitter and Facebook to avoid being regulated as a publishers, protecting them from being held liable for illegal posts, with some exceptions that I laid out in my introduction. Whereas a newspaper would be held liable for content it produces and publishes, social media companies are able to distance themselves from the content that is posted by people onto their platforms. End quote. Section 230 ensures freedom of speech remains intact online. The particular segment of Section 230 that allows companies to sidestep civil liability is often described as the 26 words that created the internet. While freedom of speech is a cornerstone of our American society and it is essential that we protect it, we should still seek common sense legislation that can both protect our freedoms and protect our lives. A Section 230 reform proposal put before the Justice Department states, quote, we must shape incentives for companies to create a safer environment, which, was which is what Section 230 was originally intended to do. What if Tarrant hadn't posted his live stream? We could have avoided the San Diego death. What if Elliot's social media presence had been flagged? He could have gotten the help he so desperately needed. In his, section two, in his 2020 article, Section 230 and the Duty to Prevent Mass Atrocities, published in the Case Western Reserve Journal of International Law, law professor at University of California, David L. Sloss, describes the nature of the amendment in question. Congress should create, quote, Congress should create an, an exception to Section 230 immunity for cases where a company fails to prevent transmission of a message, whether by words or images, if that message, A, would be understood by ordinary listeners as incitement or inducement to commit genocide or crimes against humanity, and B, there is significant risk that the recipients of that message will commit such crimes. The statute should create a duty for companies to remove such content within 24 hours of its posting. The definitions of genocide, incitement, and inducement are well defined within international and U.S. law. Through the 1969 court case, Brandenburg v. State of Ohio, we get the legal definitions and precedent for incitement and inducement. I recently conducted an interview with Professor Sloss, and at the conclusion of my questions, he stated, quote, I think we need limited intelligent censorship to protect liberal freedoms. Democracy is the foundation of individual freedom. If democracy disappears, then we will lose all individual freedom also. An amendment to Section 230 would protect our freedoms and would protect our common sense, would protect our internet through common sense boundaries and protect our freedoms simultaneously. Now, some of you may be questioning some, this, um, this type of amendment. First of all, is it practical? This is obviously not a perfect solution. This is something that we'll have to work on as a country and learn to develop a better internet. But I think it can pave the way for constitutional internet reform in the future. In a perfect world situation, Brenton Tarrant's live stream would have been taken down seconds after its posting, and Elliot Rogers' video would have been monitored and taken down almost immediately. But unfortunately, this is just not realistic with a great amount of content surging throughout the internet. All this amendment would require companies to do is to put forth a good faith effort. The primary goal of them is, the primary goal is not to make them do the impossible, but rather incentivize them to set up preventative measures to stop these things before they happen. Senator of Hawaii Brian Schatz describes the need for Section 230 reform. Quote, Section 230 was created to help jumpstart the economy while giving internet companies the responsibility to set and enforce reasonable rules on content, but it has become clear that some companies have not taken this responsibility seriously enough. However, there's not only the question of practicality with this, such an amendment, there is also the question that does this infringe on our First Amendment right? In order to address this, I want to look at what Section 230 is not. Remember the scope of this amendment. It only applies within the realm of monitoring social media companies. It's keeping them accountable for what lies on their platform. George Orwell's thought police from his, 19, from his novel 1984 will not come knocking at your door for an infraction. This amendment will only leverage social media's already given power to prevent mass atrocity. Professor Sloss adds, quote, given the global reach of major social media platforms like YouTube and Facebook, the companies arguably have a greater power to prevent mass atrocities than do many national governments. Secondly, this amendment will rely on concise legal terms that are defined and that are not vague. We can only build fair and just legislation around laws that use these concise definitions. If we don't know what our laws mean, then how are we going to interpret them? Professor Sloss again quotes, I think, um, 
Performance terrorists utilize social media available to them. Therefore, America needs common sense legislation that regulates their ability to incite and induce violence through the internet platforms in order to further protect United States citizens. Let the lives lost in those deadly shootings be our encouragement to make the world safer. Let the tragic deaths of those Santa Barbara students compel us to fight for justice. However, let's also gain perspective on the depravity of the human condition. Romans 3 says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. While these laws and reforms may help protect our society, the root problem, sin, still runs rampant in man's heart. With these tragedies in mind, let us also shout out the hope that we have in Christ to all the dark corners of the globe. Unlike any law, Christ brings profound healing and restoration to our hearts. Brent and Tarrant and Elliot Roger both need the ever-abundant and healing love of Christ. No law will ever bring fulfillment in that same way. Let us not only seek out reform that protects citizens, but also minister to those in need, and through the spreading of the gospel of redemption, overcome the problem that lies at the root of this all, sin. Thank you.